The Velvet Note's a place where you can see and hear world-class musicians in a setting that's as intimate and as comfortable as your very own living room. What we try to do here is bring down the wall that often exists between artists and audiences. We give you a chance to get to know the artist. You're always guaranteed a chance to meet the artist. And we also want you to hear the music the way that it was meant to be heard. We have the best jazz performers in the world who perform here. Uh, Grammy winners, people who are legends in the jazz field. And all you have to do is go right down the street. Here, you're able to see them and they're right in front of you. They're an arm's length away from you. It's like they're performing a private concert for you and the people you love. It's a once in a lifetime experience. Hi, I'm Carla Harris. As a performer and as a listener who has enjoyed some incredible shows at the Velvet Note over the years, I've often been struck by how when people are inside those walls, the issues of the world outside just um, fall away and the connection between everyone inside is heightened. To me, that is the power and the magic and the beauty of the live music experience. And it's why I hope that as you enjoy the encore concerts that the Velvet Note is streaming each weekend, that um, you know, if you are able, that you would click the donate button that you see somewhere on your screen, because when you do, you'll help the Velvet Note make it through this tough time and be there when we can gather again and um, feel that magic. So thanks for helping Tamara keep the stage lights and the twinkle lights on. Uh, thank you, and I hope you enjoy the music. All we need is love and music and a little chocolate now and then doesn't hurt. Please help us bring these performances into your home without charging a fee. Donate at thevelvetnote.com. Donate. Hi, I'm Tamara Fuller, owner of The Velvet Note, and we welcome you to another magical evening of music in our virtual club. Before we get started, let me introduce the band. A pianist and keyboardist currently residing in Atlanta, Georgia, Nick Rosen's calling for music began very young when he was plucking out tunes at the piano. Over the years, he's toured with Russell Gunn, Dion Ferris, Colonel Bruce Hampton, Liz Brasher, and the Magpie Salute. In early 2018, he joined the Shadow Boxers on their tour opening for Justin Timberlake. Nick has accompanied legends such as Jennifer Holliday, Roy Ayers, and Nathan East, and has appeared on albums by Curtis Fuller, soul artist Donnie and Julie Dexter, as well as newcomers like Faye Webster. He received a Bachelor of Arts in Jazz Studies from Florida State University, where his seminal piano instructors were Bill Peterson and Marcus Roberts. In early 2015, his album Step Into the Light was released on Ropa Dope Records. The album features artists Otile Burbridge, Saunders Sermons, Terion Gully, and Daryl Reeves. John Sanford is a jazz tenor saxophonist who has landed in Atlanta, Georgia after spending portions of his career in Chicago, Illinois, Long Island, New York, and Buffalo, New York. After receiving his degree from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, John was an active presence on the Chicago music scene, performing with many of Chicago's great jazz musicians, including George Flutus, Jody Christian, Jeff Parker, and many others. While in Chicago, he became a member of the critically acclaimed Sony recording artist Mighty Blue Kings, appearing on the Mighty Blue Kings Sony release live from Chicago, as well as the independent releases A Christmas Album and Alive in the City. With Mighty Blue Kings, John has toured extensively in the United States and Europe, sharing bills with B.B. King, Ray Charles, Diana Krall, Tony Bidditt, 
Buddy Guy, and many others. Billy Thornton hails from the small town of Tifton, Georgia, the oldest of four children born to his band teacher father and piano teacher mother. By the age of 13, he knew for certain that he wanted to play the bass. He graduated from the Music School of University of North Florida, where he met future colleagues Kevin Bales and Justin Varnes, amongst others. Although he was always serious about and committed to his bass skills, many of his post-college years were spent in bar bands around Jacksonville, Florida, during which time he also began singing and playing guitar. His influences are diverse, ranging from Leonard Skinner and the Allman Brothers to iconic bassists Ray Brown and Paul Chambers. On stage, Billy is probably best known for his distinctively enthusiastic, energetic style, which is quite unusual for an upright bassist. He says, If you see me dancing and smiling and sweating all over the place, it's because I'm happy. I decided a long time ago to be myself. Billy has played with acclaimed vibraphonist Christian Tambor and with international trumpeter Dominic Farinacci, with whom he performed for his TED Talk and his Jazz at Lincoln Center engagement in Qatar. In addition to his public and private performances, he is the professor of jazz bass studies in the music school of Georgia State University. Born in Jacksonville, Florida, Justin Varnes began studying music at 10, on the trumpet. His father, an avid jazz listener, exposed him to Stan Kenton, Nat King Cole, and Errol Gardner. After attending Douglas Anderson School of the Arts on trumpet, Justin then switched to the drum set and studied music at the University of North Florida, where he graduated with degrees in jazz studies and percussion. Justin relocated to New York City, where he continued to study at the New School and studied privately with Jojo Mayer, in New York, Justin began touring with Phoebe Snow, with whom he performed on the Roseanne Bar Show, as well as National Public Radio's World Cafe, where he would later perform with the pop music band Five for Fighting. Justin is currently a music teacher at the prestigious Lovett School, music director for The Velvet Note, and founder of the acclaimed online drummer's resource and the Legends of Jazz series in its seventh season.
Welcome back. I feel like I haven't done this in a while. We took a uh, we took last month off, and then this is the beginning of the of, of the new the new series, and uh, it feels like it's been a minute. So thank you guys so much for for joining us. Um, please, uh, before we get going too much further into uh, Roy Haynes' career, help me welcome Mr. John Sanford on the tenor saxophone. Mr. Nick Rosen on the piano. And joining us tonight, very special guest, a very, very good friend of mine. We go way, way back, probably farther back than uh, I want to admit. Mr. Billy Thornton on the bass. So uh, tonight, we're, uh, as uh, Tamara said, we're celebrating the, the music of the great uh, Roy Haynes. Uh, he was born uh, in March of 1925. Uh, which makes him 94 years old, and he is still kicking it, uh, and uh, playing great music uh, all, all around the world. Um, to put it into perspective, I'm, I'm currently working on a, um, a jazz septet adaptation of uh, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue that we're doing next, uh, next month over at Hilton Head, and I realized that Rhapsody in Blue and Roy Haynes are almost the same age. So that should give you some idea of how old this dude is, and he's, he's still tearing it up. Uh, so, um, but he was born in, in, in Boston, uh, in an area called Roxbury, uh, and he um, picked up drums fairly early on and was, was already gigging by the, by the time he was 18, 19 years old. And he was out in a, um, uh, he was out doing some gigs on Martha's Vineyard, and he got a telegram from a, from a band leader by the name of Lewis Russell. Uh, and Lewis Russell, he was from, uh, originally from Panama, and he had a, a stint at the Savoy Ballroom in New York. He had never heard Roy play, um, but had gotten wind of this great young drummer up, uh, up, in, up in the Boston area, sent him a telegram and, and basically told him exactly how much he would make. So all you gotta do is move to New York and you got yourself a gig. So he packed up his drum set and moved to New York. And um, he played with that band for, for a couple of years, but what, what was really important about it is while he was cutting his teeth with this with this big band, he was um, put smack dab in the middle of the jazz mecca, which is basically 52nd Street, in the in the mid 40s, right when bebop was starting to blossom. So Roy spent every night and every day basically hopping from club to club and sitting in and meeting all these these great artists. Um, and it was uh, through that that his career skyrocketed in a, in a, in a matter of years. He uh, went from playing uh, uh, with Lewis Russell, uh, he got uh, recommended to play with um, the great Lester Young. Uh, this is only when he, he, was, he was still 20 years old when he got this call. And Lester had a, had a, had a pretty serious reputation for uh, being difficult on drummers. For those of you who came to the Lester Young one, you'll remember that Lester started off as a drummer. So he's really, he's really hard on drummers. And uh, Roy started uh, doing his very first gig with them, and about two tunes in, uh, to hear Roy explain, he said, Lester, Wong, Lester Young didn't walk. He just somehow could glide. You never saw his feet move. You just, you're just there and all of a sudden you see him moving toward you, you don't know how. But he, he, in the middle of the tune, he just like glided back towards Roy and said, hey Prez, you sure are swinging, man. He said, uh, if you've got eyes, the gig is yours. And so to translate really hip jazz speak, it means if you want this gig, it is yours. Uh, so, which is uh, pretty impressive considering that it only took about two tunes to do that. So, he played with Lester Young for a couple of years uh, and then um, uh, was picked up uh, by, uh, by Bud Powell. The first tune we played tonight was entitled Bouncing with Bud, and it's a Bud Powell composition. It was one of the first recordings that um, Roy Haynes made. It was in 1949. Uh, Bud Powell, of course, is a, a very famous and influential uh, bebop jazz pianist. So we started working with Bud Powell um, in, uh, on 52nd Street in a club called the Onyx Club. And right across the street, a very good friend of his by the name of Max Roach was playing. Max was a couple years older than Roy and both Max Roach and Art Blakey kind of took Roy under their wings and looked out for him, tried to get them gigs, etc. Well, uh, Max was playing across the street with Charlie Parker. And uh, he came over to, to, to Roy and said, hey, I'm thinking of leaving Charlie Parker. Uh, me and Miles are going to split and kind of do our, our own thing. Uh, and I was wondering if you wanted to play uh, in Charlie Parker's band, which is just an extreme honor. And so naturally, Roy said, 
I don't know, man. I'm, I'm kind of really digging this butt pal guy. We're playing with Billy Eckstein. It's great over here. I, I think I'm okay. And Max was like, oh, oh, okay, I guess I'll go back and tell Bird you don't want the gig. Because uh, at the time, Charlie Parker was about as big as you could get. And then, and then Roy said, two days later, Charlie Parker came over and said, hey, man, you sure you don't want to play with me? And Roy's like, oh, yeah, no, okay, I'll do that. So he, so he picked up, he picked up with, uh, with, um, with Charlie Parker at that point, and this is 1949. Uh, basically, the beginning of the year, he was with Bud Powell, and by the end of the year, he was with Charlie Parker. So here he is, uh, still just 24 years old, and he has already worked with Lester Young, Bud Powell, and Charlie Parker, but he wasn't done from there. Um, he worked with Charlie Parker for a little while, and then uh, got the gig with the great Sarah Vaughn. He was with Sarah Vaughn for about five years. Um, and it was right around then that, that his, his career really took off. It, uh, he got a stint with Louis Armstrong, and uh, so in about the first 10 years, he played with about every jazz legend known to man. Um, and as he started to develop his own career, he started to uh, start to create his own records as well as own albums. Uh, and started playing on some of the biggest and most influential albums out there. If you remember when we did Blues in the Abstract Truth a couple of months ago, that was Roy Haynes on that. He recorded that in 61. And Roy Haynes also has the distinct honor of being the only drummer ever to sub for the great Elvin Jones in John Coltrane's band. There's only a few times that Elvin couldn't make gigs or record dates, and when that happened, John only wanted Roy Haynes. Uh, which is about the highest compliment you, you can have. So uh, during that stretch in 1961, when, when Elvin was unavailable, they made a great record uh, with, with John Coltrane entitled Impressions. And we're gonna play a tune for you off that record right now. It's one of the few songs Elvin never got to record with, with John Coltrane. Uh, it's a beautiful tune, it's one, actually one of my favorite tunes of all time. It's a John Coltrane composition entitled Dear Lord. Thank you. 
Thank you guys so much. So again, that's 1961. He's already recorded with John Coltrane. He's played with Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald at this point, Sarah Vaughan, uh, Charlie Parker, Lester Young. He just fell right into the lap of uh, one of the most prolific and important periods of jazz. And um, so his, his playing grew quite a lot uh, through there. A lot of what he was doing early on um, with, with Louis Russell and with um, Bud Powell and Charlie Parker and all that, was playing the style of drums that, that he heard uh, everyone else playing at that time. But his personal style uh, developed in, in kind of a unique way, and uh, which we're gonna get to uh, later on in terms of, of how it changed the sound of jazz, which hasn't quite happened yet here in 1961. Um, when he, he, I told you he grew up in uh, the Roxbury area of, of Boston, and uh, his, his, uh, his parents, are from uh, originally from Barbados, and uh, they moved to um, they moved to Boston about two years before Roy was born. So he grew up in Boston, and uh, you know he he literally he got kicked out of school for playing drums on his desk too much. It's the true story. He actually got kicked out of school. They told him, "Do not come back unless you will stop playing drums on the on the desk." And his parents were like, "I don't think that's going to happen." So he stopped going to school. He got kicked out of school and uh, decided to play even more drums. But when he was uh, when he was growing up, uh, he didn't. He was beating on desks and stuff because they, his his family didn't have money for a drum set. 
but one of his friends uh, uh, got him a, uh, I guess an old, an old snare drum and one cymbal. And he, because that's, old, that's what he had when he started, and he had to add each piece one at a time, his style developed differently than most drummers. So he just had a snare drum and, and, and a cymbal. So to give you some sort of contrast as to how Roy's sound on the drums was different than most people's, um, in the 1940s, 1950s, there pretty much had been a set way that the drum set was supposed to play jazz. Each of the four limbs kind of had a, a predetermined or a defined role. So the bass drum, in this case, with the right foot, is supposed to keep this nice, steady, thumping feel so that everyone can dance to it. And then the left foot is supposed to play like little finger snaps. So that's what the feet are doing. And then the right hand plays that steady ding, ding, a ding pattern. See if I can pull this off. And then the left hand, I can't. Hold on, I can do this, I can just watch this. And then the left hand accents when it feels like it, like this. So, thank you. Good night. So that's, that's the sound of, of big band jazz, of swing dance jazz, and, and the beginnings of bebop jazz. Um, that each limb has kind of their own assigned role, and you're supposed to play them all at the same time. Well, Roy didn't have that. Roy only had a snare drum and a cymbal. So when Roy played, this will be impossible to do. John, will you stop drinking water and be useful just for one minute? That's great, it's a great shot. They can see your Adam's apple and everything. Okay, you're gonna come over here and hold this microphone. You'll be my mic stand. Ladies and gentlemen, the most expensive microphone stand on the planet, Mr. John Sanford. So, so Roy just had a, um, you really are terrible, this is great. Okay, uh, so. Sorry, carry on. I deserve it, I deserve it, I'm not gonna say I don't. Okay, so he just had a snare drum and a cymbal, so he was trying to do all that with just these two sounds. And then he spent an entire summer working at a camp so he could finally afford a bass drum. And this is during, this is, you know, mid 40s, so this was during World War II. You're doing great. During World War II, so uh, the drum company stopped using uh, particular materials, particularly metals and stuff, because they needed it for the war. So he, he had to get an all wooden bass drum. It was this big 26 inch bass drum. So he had finally a cymbal, a snare drum, and a bass drum. So then he mixed in the bass drum like this. After doing that for a long time, he finally got ridiculed because he didn't have one of these things. These are called hi-hats. So he finally got enough money to get a hi-hat. But by that time, these other three limbs had already worked everything out. So when he added the hi-hat, he didn't add it like a, he peppered it in like this. Thank you, John Sanford. <laughs> um, so that actually uh, uh, affected it, influenced how he uh, developed his uh, unique drum sound. Now we're still in the like swing. We're basically you know early 1960s. It's the, the jazz still basically sounded a lot like bebop at, the, at that point. So he had yet to really find an avenue for that, but but uh, that that's coming very soon. Um, the, uh, uh, the next thing that he did as he got into the early 60s is, he, is as he was developing his own sound, he finally started to start making his own records. So he, uh, he had lots of nicknames. One of his, one of his nicknames was um, Princess Wee Wee. And there is a story, I promise, and it's not what you think. Uh, uh, back in the big band days, bass drums used to be about this high, right? Huge bass drums. And uh, when, he, when Roy got his first kit, we finally got enough, got enough money with Lester Young, he bought his very first professional drum set. And it had a 20-inch bass drum, which was only about this high, which is still kind of a big bass drum, but 
When he first brought that in, Lester Young nicknamed the bass drum Princess Wee Wee because it was such a tiny, tiny bass drum. And Roy hated it so much that that became his nickname as well. <laughs> Luckily, he outgrew that nickname and, came, and another nickname developed for him called Snap Crackle. And that's because of that style that I was playing sounds like popcorn just popping everywhere. And he had, he had a really tight sounding drums, really high, really snappy sounding uh, drum set. And uh, so he developed the name Snap Crackle. So when he wrote his very first tune, he entitled it Snap Crackle. As you will learn about Roy Haynes, Roy loves his own name. There's, uh, one of my favorite Roy Haynes records is called When It's Haynes, It Roars. <laughs> yeah, think about that one. He's got another one called Roy Ulti. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of those. And so anyway, <laughs> but, but this tune is what a tune he wrote entitled Snap Crackle, and to show you how much uh, he loves the sound of his own name, I'm gonna play you exactly what the introduction is on the original record. This is off of a, an album from 1963 called Out of the Afternoon. It's actually Roy's favorite um, solo album, and it happens to be my favorite solo album of his as well. It's called Out of the Afternoon. This is Snap Crackle. At least the first eight bars or so are verbatim. Here we go.
Thornton on the base. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, I mentioned that uh, Roy's family uh, uh, brought him to um, to Boston at an early age. Uh, one of the things that he, um, uh, one of the things Roy's known for, as I've been alluding to, is the fact that he's played with literally almost every major jazz musician. You name it, he's played Miles, Thelonious Monk, you name it. Uh, I think the only person he never had to play with that he always wanted to was Duke Ellington. But outside of that, he played pretty much with everyone. And he attributes his ability to get along with everyone and play with everyone uh, and be able to fit in a, co a musical conversation with basically anyone on the bandstand it, uh, was from his neighborhood. He says his parents dropped him into a neighborhood that uh, there was a synagogue down the street. There was uh, an Indian family on this side. There was a you know a Jewish family on that side. There were some uh, you know, African Americans right down the street. Uh, he had an Italian guy on one side of him. So he his entire neighborhood was extremely diverse, and he just grew up being able to speak to and hang out with basically just about anybody. And he like I said, he attributes that to his ability to whether it be someone uh, you know from way back like Louis Armstrong. He could hop up and play with Louis Armstrong, and then. You know, a, a week later he can play with John Coltrane, which is which is uh, pretty remarkable. Um, but while growing up in Boston, he, uh, he met a, a, a he met a man that eventually would connect him to this man's son. He was on a gig with Stan Getz. Uh, he toured for a while in the mid to late '60s with the great Stan Getz. And on that tour, his very first gig uh, at a club in um, Chicago called the London House. He met a young pianist who was also from Boston, uh, and his name was Chick Corea. They met on that gig and immediately hit it off. And um, uh, if you guys remember from the Chick Corea show, Chick Corea is also a drummer. So they uh, they both hit it off, being from Boston and having a, a lot of the same uh, friends. And it turned out, like I said, that Roy had actually met Chick's father years ago in Boston. So the two of them hit it off and they started to put their own projects together. And it's really here, it's really his collaboration with Chick Corea that, that allowed Roy Haynes to open up his sound and uh, create um, his, his unique voice, to finally put his personal stamp uh, on the music. He'd been spending so many years accompanying and supporting so many great artists that he's finally now at the stage able to start creating his own music in his own sound, and he does it in a collaboration with Chick Corea. So uh, we're gonna do a tune off of, uh, of one of the early records that they did. This is, I think, 1968. It's a um, very famous, very influential uh, Chick Corea album entitled Now He Sings, Now He Sobs. Uh, and it's a trio record with, um, with uh, Roy Haynes. And we're gonna do a tune off of that uh, entitled Matrix, uh, and it's a it's a great Roy Haynes feature as well as obviously Chick Corea. So here we're gonna, uh, as you might you already noticed, there's no John Sanford. He just left. He didn't he didn't ask to leave the stage and nothing. He just usually I'm at the bar, but it's here on the couch. Okay, okay. 
Somebody please wake him up at the end of this song. For me. Um, or don't, no, it's fine. Uh, so we're going to do a, a trio version of uh, um, Chick Corea's The Matrix.
Nick Rosen on the piano. Right? We sound better as a trio, don't we? I don't know what that is. I'm feeling really more lightweight up here. I don't know what it is. Put my finger on it. John can hold the microphone. Thank you so much, Mr. Hunter. Thank you. That's your new job. Okay, I believe it. Do you want, do you want to play the next song from there? Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Um, so uh, you can kind of hear from that sound that uh, Roy and, uh, and Chick Corea and the bass player on that record, uh, Miroslav V2, um, they were, were starting to engage in, in a, a new sound of jazz that was more open, it was more free, there was more interplay going on in, in the rhythm section interaction, um, less just kind of like keeping the beat for the, the featured artist up front. John Sanford. So see how, see how much better it is for the rhythm section there. Um, so Roy was, was one of the, the few holdouts from the bebop era that, that not, not only survived into the late 60s and 70s and into the 80s where jazz completely changed and basically eschewed this whole swing feeling, this straight ahead swing danceable tempo thing. It kind of you know, left that behind and a lot of um, jazz musicians who developed in the 40s and 50s found it hard to, to fit in with this new sound of jazz, but Roy was, was one of the few that, that kind of did the opposite. His career actually flourished in this. And he started getting um, calls from uh, a ton of great uh, modern players from the, from the 70s and the 80s, and um, this really propelled his career until he eventually became his own um, standalone solo artist, which is obviously what he is now. But in the 70s and 80s, as he's playing with Chick Corea, he's starting to meet some great musicians, vibraphonist Gary Burton, a great uh, Miles Davis bassist uh, by the name of Dave Holland. And Gary hired Chick Corea, um, Roy Haynes, and um, Dave Holland to do a record with them, and a young, uh, impressionable guitar player by the name of Pat Metheny for this, for this album. And Pat did one of his songs on, on this record, um, this was in the, uh, basically in the, in the late 70s. And uh, it was such a hit off of this record, at least in the jazz world it was a hit, that years later, about, about a decade or so later, uh, Pat recorded a trio record with that, um, that same bassist, Dave Holland, and Roy Haynes, uh, and titled the album This Tune Name because um, uh, Roy and Pat had such a, a great time playing this tune together. So, uh, and even since then, both Pat and Roy on separate gigs and together play this tune a lot. We're gonna play it for you right now. It's a Pat Metheny composition entitled Question and Answer. Thank you. 
Sanford. That's fine. <laughs> you survived for another one. Um, so um, Roy really did help so many of these uh, uh, players like Chick Corea, Pat Metheny, Gary Burton, a lot of these great uh, musicians that shaped the sound of uh, 70s and 80s jazz. He kind of, you know, he grew up basically being younger than, than Bird and Max and Blakey and Lester Young. And he was always the, the young kid uh, running around, you know, trying to play with, with, these, with these great masters. And then in the 70s and 80s, he finds that the role has reversed now. And he is the mentor to these younger musicians um, and is helping them find their own sounds and, and supporting their own careers. And uh, this continues to lead um, Roy down the path of, of starting his own group where basically he does that. I'd mentioned before that um, Roy uh, was very close with Art Blakey. Art Blakey was uh, a couple, several years older than, than Roy Haynes and took Roy under his wing. And one of the things that, uh, that Roy decided to do uh, later on in his life is do what Art Blakey did. When Art Blakey would hire these young up, up and coming musicians. Sometimes right out, they'd pl he'd pluck them right out of college and say, come with me. I'm gonna teach you jazz, but I'm gonna teach you on the road. You're gonna play in my band I'm, every night, I'll coach you up, and then eventually your careers will build up, and then you know, you'll know you blossom and move on, and, and then I'll bring some other younger kids in. It basically became like a school. You, you wanted to play in Art Blakey's band so that you could, you could kind of graduate from the University of Art Blakey, if you will. Well, Roy took this to heart as well and started uh, his own group. Um, this is in the late 90s, early 2000s called the Fountain of Youth. And he would hire these, uh, and still does, hires these, these, these young up and coming musicians and he would train them and teach them on the bandstand. And, and it, it's worked out great. It's worked out to be a wonderful symbiotic relationship because it helps keep Roy young and he's still out there playing. Um, as a matter of fact, I heard Roy, this is maybe four or five years ago down at the Rialto. And, I, and I'm not making this up. It was literally the best I've ever heard him play. He was playing on a whole other level than, than anything I'd ever heard from him before. And it was just mind blowing to realize that, that in his 90s, he's still growing and evolving and improving as a drummer. And he's passing along knowledge to these younger musicians, helping pass on what he learned in the 40s and 50s on 52nd Street with Charlie Parker and Lester Young and all these great musicians. And in turn, those young musicians are keeping Roy Young and keeping him out there working. So. Um, we're going to close tonight out with a song that, that he has recorded several times with his group. Uh, if you go out and find the record Fountain of Youth, Roy Haynes' Fountain of Youth is their first record. It was in 2004. Uh, this song is on here. It has a special um, connection, a special meaning for Roy, because I mentioned his very close connection with Chick Corea. Chick and Roy Haynes were avid believers in that Thelonious Monk was one of the greatest American composers of all time, uh, particularly in, in the jazz idiom. And Roy got a chance to work uh, with, of course he did, because he worked with everybody, but he worked with Thelonious Monk for about three or four years in, in, his, in his quartet. And Chick and Roy, on a lot of the records they did, they always usually record a couple of Thelonious Monk songs. And so this is my favorite track off of that Fountain of Youth record. We're gonna close it out with, um, uh, with Thelonious Monk's Green Chimneys. But before I do, please help me thank once again, Mr. John Sanford on the tennis saxophone. <laughs> and microphone holding skills. Yeah. Add that to your resume, good boy. All right, Mr. Nick Rosen on the piano. <laughs> Just the piano, no other accessories. And Billy Thornton playing bass and giving me dirty looks all night. Let's give it up for Billy Thornton. My name, is, my name is Justin Barnes. Thank you so much for coming out. It's been a Sunday evening with us. We really do appreciate it. Uh, again, we're going to close out with uh, Thelonious Monk composition entitled Green Chimney.
Thomas there from the Tennis Axe Hall. Billy Thornton on the bass. This is Nick Rosen on the piano. My name is Justin Barnes. Thank you so much for coming out. And uh, uh, who we have next? Do you remember who we have next? Coleman Hawkins. Uh, next month, next May, we're doing a Coleman Hawkins gig. So um, he won't be here, but uh, John Sanford will be in his place. So please stick around for that. Thank you guys again so much. Have a great night.